I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you wish to follow along, to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 2. The reading of verses 1 through 18. Second Peter, chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them and bring swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned. I just realized that it should be first, Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. I followed the bulletin instead of my sermon notes. Another reminder of our frailty. If you turn the page to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by the way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fa fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with fervent heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest, being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity." In verse 1, we have a reflection of the Apostle Peter's pastoral heart. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind 
by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. The word reminder is a crucial pastoral word. The word remember is a crucial pastoral exhortation. And if you recall, every time we administer the ordinance established by Christ the night of his betrayal, which we commonly call the Lord's Supper or communion, the words do this in remembrance of me are an integral and inseparable part of the proper administration of that ordinance and the proper partaking and receiving of the elements. If you think about it, there is, in a sense, not just physical gravity in this fallen world. Things tend to run down. Even the unregenerate have acknowledged there exists a principle that nobody has successfully reputed, the second law of thermodynamics, in which, basically, putting it in layman's terms, the earth is slowly but steadily running down, like a if you will, a car running out of gas or a battery running out of energy. So we are called, not just here by Peter, but in other places, to be stirred up, to be energized, to be quickened, to be urged, I think we can say that very properly, urged to remember certain things. And the one of the most particular is the second coming of Christ and all that is involved with that. Now, if you have your hymnals, you turn to the very back, to page 868, the end of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And I think that we can certainly, as with every facet of Scripture, find somebody who abuses it somewhere. And some churches make a point of uh, preaching almost exclusively on the Day of Judgment, which is taking Scripture away from the uh, proportions of Scripture that should govern uh, our preaching selections. But on the other hand, uh, in the Reformed churches, I don't think we can be accused of overly giving attention, too much attention to this subject. Verse or verse, paragraph 3 of the last judgment, I said 868, it's 867 if you turn back a page. Paragraph 3, as Christ would have us to be certainly persuaded that there shall be a day of judgment, both to deter all men from sin and for the greater consolation of the godly in their adversity the greater consolation of the ungodly in their adversity. So will he have that day unknown to men that they may shake off all carnal security and be always watchful because they know not at what hour the Lord will come and may be ever prepared to say, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. The unsaved cannot say that with joy and confidence. And indeed, only Christians can address the subject of the, the day of judgment and not be consumed with the kind of fear reflected in Revelation 6 that we read earlier. So we can say that the coming of Jesus Christ is a crucial matter. Would you turn to Revelation chapter 1, please? Revelation chapter 1, first three verses and then 7 and 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must shortly take place. This is written 2,000 years ago now. And he sent and communicated it by his angels to his bondservant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, 
for the time is near. Verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We know that the world and unbelievers suppress discussion or consideration of this. We were reminded in Romans 1 of the fact that men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And in 2 Timothy 3, we have another reminder. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that as we consider this subject of the second coming of Jesus Christ, his return, as it's sometimes called, we see this as intended by Almighty God to be an encouragement, not to be something to strike fear in our hearts, but to weightily encourage us to strive against spiritual entropy, the slow but steady running down in our commitment and conduct. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has a good reminder of this problem. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning with verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, that lawless one, will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, one who is a coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. And then verse 10, the dynamic in which this occurs. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So if you this morning, as we consider these things, believe that in some measure God has given you a love of the truth, this should be a great encouragement to you in considering these texts concerning the second coming. Verse 11, for this reason, the reason that they did not receive a love of the truth, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So it's incumbent upon us to acknowledge that the deceitfulness that is spread amongst the unsaved, both by teachers and recipients, is part of the sovereignty of God in dealing judicially and consequentially with those who do not love the truth, those who do not read it, those who do not believe it. So what should we think of concerning Christ's second coming? Where does that have a practical bearing on our life as believers? In a society that is rejecting the faith in Christ more and more. Well, I think there's several principles we need to bear in mind so that at the very least, we don't consume our finite, and I do mean finite, limited, emotional and spiritual energies by being surprised at the obvious. If we are surprised by the events of evil that takes place, 
That's a rebuke to us that we have not seriously considered the scriptures. And so the first principle that we should recognize is always one to bear in mind. Well expressed in Matthew 13, beginning with verse 24, the parable of the wheat and tares. That reflects the condition of the church until the day of harvesting, speaking in the parabolic terms. That the enemy, parenthesis, that is Satan, Christ said in that parable, sows tares among the wheat. And tares we have in California. They're called Darnell, is one of the names for them. And at first blush, they can look just like a head of wheat. But when you get closely, get close to them, you can see that they don't have grains of wheat, but they have a nasty little feature that if you touch them with your clothing, they stick to you. And they're very difficult to get out of your clothing. We call them foxtails in the valley here. But there's, that's a, an example of the tares or the darnel of which Christ spoke. So if we're surprised that sometimes within the church of Jesus Christ there arises enemies of the gospel, it means we've not taken a very simple parable seriously. Every century has had the worst enemies of the church arise from within and not from without. And so that's a humbling reminder, I believe, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, Beware that him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And a very practical application of that is to acknowledge that but for God's grace, we could be tares. That's all of grace if we are not. And then there's a second issue that we need to, to remember. If you will, please turn to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, Christ himself had some very significant things to say concerning the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 35, Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. The day, the month, the year, the hour is known only to God. For as the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand. Notice that verb. The deception we've been noting prom that's promised. Did not understand in those days that until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 44, for this reason you be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So unexpectedness is a given, a centerpiece issue that as in the days of Noah, once again, it would be a cosmic, if you will, societal obliviousness to the promise of his coming. And so obviously we have a duty as people interact with us and if they ask us spiritual questions to be careful not to omit where that's appropriate to raise the question that there will be a total unawareness on the part of unbelievers. Surprise will be writ, la writ large. Horror, if you take the passage in Revelation 6 that we read already, and then the third thing that we have to note is that there will be a great falling away from the faith before the end. And in Luke chapter 18, Christ raises with a question that sobering realization. Luke 18. Verse 6, the end of the parable of the unrighteous judge. 
And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now shall not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? It's a rhetorical question. The answer, obviously, is no. I tell you, however, that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's a question that clearly, if we understand its proper interpretation, indicates that those who are faithful will be fewer and fewer at the very end before his coming. And then finally, we need to remember that society will be corrupted, extremely corrupted. Would you turn to Second Timothy chapter 3, the first seven verses. Familiar passage reminding us of the condition of the human race before Christ's coming. Realize this, 2 Timothy 3.1, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers. And a reviler is one who speaks contemptuously of others, especially those in authority. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, though they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Would you concede upon reflection that every one of those characteristic behaviors is abundantly present in our culture today? So what should we remember about the actual coming? Well, I've already read to you from Matthew 24 the statement of Christ that only the Father knows the day of his coming, which is a good way of saying by necessary consequence that Christ's return is absolutely certain. It's absolutely certain. There's nothing to debate for the serious student of Scripture that the day is coming. There's lots of debates about when, but the fact of the coming should not be up to open even for question in our thinking. Now there's a second principle that's important to remember that we see in our text in Second Peter, if you care to turn there. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter three. Oops, if I get 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So there's a sense, and I struggle with the right verb here because we're dealing with the sovereignty of God put in anthropomorphic terms, that's terms that we frail creatures of dust, we sheep, spiritual sheep can understand, that there's a sense in which we are told that God is postponing or deferring, if you will, to grant mercy to those who have not yet repented, to give them time to repent. And I don't intend to dwell on that other than to note that we who honor Jesus Christ by God's grace should be zealous if people tell us that they think God has delayed his coming in some unreasonable way, that we should be jealous that his 
apparent postponement of his coming is perfectly in accord with his gracious will that men will repent. The same thing has occurred already in the human race. It's been estimated that it took Noah a century to build the ark. And we know from Peter's first epistle that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he had a small success in the, being instrumental in the conversion of those who were rebellious against God. So we should not be surprised if when we earnestly persuade men to take seriously the repeated warnings and reminders that Christ is coming again, we should not be disheartened if they disregard it. And then if you look at verses 10 and 11, again in 1 Peter, when it does, he does come, the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up since all these things are to be destroyed in this way is a very clear statement that complete destruction of the present heavens and the earth is part of God's plan. And as I've already proposed to you, that those who do not believe when his second coming does occur will be confounded and confused almost beyond comprehension and paralyzed by fear. Now there's a couple of truths that are important to remember that when Christ comes, all will be judged. And this is, has been through the centuries a point of confusion for many in the church. But, Paul, but Peter makes that very clear in 1 Peter 4. Let's turn there. 1 Peter 4. Verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Notice, to begin with the household of God. Judgment. That's where it begins. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Rhetorical questions, but worthy of considering that Christ's words, that the way to eternal life is narrow and few that be that find it, is a good remembrance to be diligent on a regular basis of searching our hearts and examining our hearts for heart sin, if there's anything that's coming between us and our fellowship with Jesus Christ. And then, of course, praise God, when he does come and the judgment is complete that Christ describes in Matthew, Matthew 25, that great chapter, the redeemed will be accounted as pardoned and exonerated, uh, that the charge against them will not be applicable because Christ died in their place and took that punishment and curse upon himself. And so that's a great hope. But it makes this tremendously real, I think, if we look at our society as an alien place and rightly understand it as headed to destruction. So some thoughts by way of application. I began our consideration by suggesting that it should be the subject of Christ's second coming should be an encouragement to believers. But are there some specific points that should particularly catch our attention for practical daily living? And I did not by any means cite all the texts dealing with the issue of deception. Now deception means that you do not see something as it really is. Deception is both the process and the state of not being able to clearly see the truth. I believe that the best description I've ever heard of the state of true insanity is the loss of the ability to distinguish between truth and falsehood. 
between what's real and what's fantasy. And if you remember that the things that are not seen are eternal and the things that are seen are temporal, that we can say that people who put all their hope in this present existence and focus entirely on this life only meet one of the high-profile criteria of insanity. And there's a certain sense in which we can say if you do not embrace the salvation that's in Christ and the, what accompanies that by way of godly living and hope, uh, you are, in the truest and ultimate sense of the word, insane in the most terrible sense. So if we think of warnings, one of the... Um, crucial reference points should be the cautionary words to be on guard against deception. And another way of putting it is that the best way to be on guard against deception is to be zealous in studying the truth. I've mentioned it before in this pulpit, but I think it bears uh, mention again that most bank tellers are taught to recognize counterfeits, not by showing them counterfeits, but by their repeated dealing with genuine currency that after a while, its appearance becomes so locked in their frontal lobes that they instinctively can catch a counterfeit bill passing through their hands. And so we're told that we have a duty to be careful with doctrine. The word doctrine is not liked in some Christian circles, but all it means is teaching. That's what the word means. That solid, careful teaching is one of the protective blessings that God has given to his church, that Christ gives to his people. And so such things as Bible study and sermons that lay out the truths of God's word in careful, systematic ways with application is one of the greatest blessings, functional blessings, this side of eternity. That God has equipped his church, if it's faithful, to proclaim the whole counsel of God, as Paul said to the Ephesian elders, as recorded in Acts 20. Acts 20 that he did not refrain from preaching earnestly the whole counsel of God. And then the second one that should be a reminder to us is separating ourselves from wickedness. Now to 2 Peter chapter 2 for a moment. Second okay. Peter chapter 2. Verse 17. In this discussion that Peter has about the ungodly that's similar to what Jude said, he says, These are springs without water, mists driven by a storm, for which the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires and by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the minor. So there's an a, a, encouragement there to guard against corruption and of course Peter is not the only writer of scripture that warns us this the writer of Hebrews twice in two different places 
warns us against turning away from that which we have known. So guarding our heart is not only against deception, but against slow incremental decreasing in our walk and our commitment. The word growing is crucial. The word sanctification is crucial. The process of sanctification is vital to a healthy spiritual walk. And then John tells us, the apostle in 1 John 2, don't love the world. Verses 15 through 17. Don't love the world. And be separate from the world, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Now that's tough. And it's, it's a tough thing to do because if we are really analytically honest, the world has influenced the church in a number of ways. The world has, I believe, influenced the church much more than the church has influenced the world. And that secular ways of thinking and behaving have bit by bit crept into the church over the decades. And I believe none of us fully understand the many ways in which we have unwittingly, incrementally, bit by bit, adopted the sins of the world. J.C. Ryle, who wrote that great seminal study on holiness, godly Anglican minister who lived from about 1820 to 1900, had an interesting thing to say about this. He said, loathe heart sins and fight against them. Loathe heart sins, sins of the heart especially, and fight against them. And this evening, God sparing us, we will consider probably the most obvious heart sin mentioned in the Ten Commandments, which is the tenth, beware of covetousness, because that can be entirely internal and unrecognized externally by anybody. And so we have a capacity to unwittingly embrace bit by bit the sins that are ruinous to a radiant walk with Jesus Christ. I believe that one of the best texts available for helping us recover a perspective if we've been tempted to go astray is found in two places in Hebrews 12. Over the years, I've come to more and more appreciate the first three verses of Hebrews 12 as a lighthouse, a beacon of light in troublous times to help us keep our feet on the straight path that leads to eternal life. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, notice the next phrase, and the sin which so easily entangles us. And I'm going to pause there to ask a pastoral question. Is there anyone here who thinks they are beyond the potential of being easily entangled by sin. Are you willing to raise your hand if you believe that you are beyond being tempted, potentially tempted? I would not for all the money in the world raise my hand to a question like that. So he's calling us to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, that's the shame of the cross, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so you may not grow weary and lose heart. I believe that's the cornerstone of maintaining a clear perspective on the world in which we seek to walk that straight path leading to eternal life. And then further down in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 14, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification of without which 
no one will see the Lord. And the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Translation, if there isn't some growth in us over time, our conversion is suspect, putting it simply. I want to close by asking you to go back to our text in Second Peter. Second Peter, oops. Second Peter, chapter three. Peter concludes with application in verse fourteen and following. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Diligence, due diligence. That means an investment of some degree of spiritual energy, of the uh, sanctification of the will, to use the means of grace day by day to walk in peace more and more blamelessly. And regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. Verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity, the day of Jesus Christ. May God give us the grace to understand this is not works righteousness, but this is the living out of the saving grace of Christ, working in and through us and through his word to sanctify us by way of his preparing our hearts if we are those among those who witness the second coming, but to prepare our hearts to be with him in glory forever and forever. Amen. I'd ask you at this time...